All right, everyone, come take your seats. Come take your seats. Okay, yeah. Okay. I got notes. I got notes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day three of Coalesce. I hope y'all are feeling hydrated. Yeah, yeah. Drinking your coffee. Well, hello, my name is Erica Louie. I am the head of data at DVT Labs, and I'm gonna be the MC of this session. Um, not biased, but I think it's the best session at Coalesce. Um, the title of this session is What Classes from Role-Playing Games Can Teach Us About a Career in Data? And we're gonna be joined by Ian, an analytics engineer at DVT Labs. Um, Ian is colloquially known as the killer of marts and dims, the slayer of entity schemas, and also the data master of the data team! Woo <laughs> um, as you can all imagine, Ian loves board games, VR games, and unsurprisingly, role-playing games. I know, shocker, right? So, all chat conversations, all Q&As, all questions, concerns, compliments are going to be in the Coalesce What Classes From, Coalesce What Classes From channel um, in DBT Slack. Um, if you're not part of the DBT community on Slack, it's day three, come on, go on community.getdbt.com and sign up and then look for this session. Look for this channel, okay. So, some, you know, logistics here. We are 30 seconds ahead of our remote counterparts, so do not spoil anything if you can. I know it's going to be hard because this session is going to be incredible, um, but enough of me. Ian? All right, let's start with tech. Everybody can hear me okay. I can tell. All right, I'm going to clicker. So as Rick said, we're about to talk about what classes from role-playing games can teach us about a career in data. Uh, if you're not familiar with role-playing games, do not worry. Um, a lot of these things are uh, familiar tropes from film, television, and even books. Um, and you'll probably recognize them as we go along. Um, so don't feel like you'll be out of it. Uh, some of my bona fides, uh, this slide feels a little weaker to me, but as Rick mentioned, I'm an analytics engineer on the internal data team at DBT Labs. Before that, uh, I worked as a BI manager. I had a function called data intelligence, which was in the org chart, me and a picture of my dog. Uh, and then also at my last job, I was a, uh, became an analytics engineer as it started becoming a thing and became a staff member of the team. Um, before that, as a lot of people have heard me say this week, I was an actuary for 12 years, so I've had a, a lot of experience with very different types of companies, uh, from the incredibly structured annual valuation process of actuaries to now working a lot more in startup and growth and software. So um, that's sort of my experience, but more importantly, why I can talk about role-playing games. So I've been a role player for longer than I've been an analytics engineer or even a data professional. Um, and uh, I, last week I played Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in three different games. So uh, I feel very well immersed in this. And also my Twitter handle, uh, Caverax, is actually my character. I've been playing Caverax, a uh, Dragonborn fighter for five years. I've known him longer than anyone here. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, so follow along. I promise it's not usually this spicy. But, um, yeah, so this is the sort of background that I feel like I have. But most importantly, I have management experience. <laughs> um, if you do not know how much coordination and planning and quick thinking and construction and destruction uh, being a dungeon master takes, you won't find it that different from being a data professional. Uh, I once heard it described as writing a play that then a bunch of improv actors come and show and do. Um, and so, you know, not that dissimilar from, from having stakeholders who are going to use the data without you. Um, so now that I've established that, a couple of the bounds of today's discussion, I am talking about fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons just to sort of focus it. For those of you who don't know what that means, that's fine. It's for the people who do know what that means. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, I had to go through 12 different classes and decide how they were related to data. So some of them are a little stretchy, but I actually kind of felt like I ended up in a place that I'm pretty happy with. And uh, finally, I have created slides for each section in which I describe characters from pop culture that I think fit the mold um, to help those who are not familiar with the classes sort of lock in and for everyone else to talk about and to have hot takes about. So please get in the Slack channel on those. So without further ado, um, let's, let's try to combine a, a class with data professionalism. 
Yep, let's start with barbarians. Um, barbarians are the meat shields of the adventuring party. They're primal warriors who come al alive in the chaos of combat. Their, their uh, particular mechanic is they answer something that's called a rage. All right, a rage allows them to fight relentlessly, and they start becoming resistant to different types of damage, typical weapon damage, slashing, bludgeoning, piercing. They don't feel it as much as they used to. They do a little bit more damage themselves when they're in a rage, and they can do even more damage if they extend themselves in what's called a reckless attack. So they make themselves easier to hit so that they can hit more easily. And finally, they stay raging as long as either they attack someone or they take damage themselves. So no matter what happens, they're able to stay in the zone. And that, I think, is what barbarians have to teach us. It means we should stay in the zone. What is a rage except for an incredibly violent zone? Um, and this kind of teaches us that we can stay heads down on a project when we're working on something. It is very easy to hit stumbling blocks when you're working. Um, you can have things like a tech obstacle, all of a sudden you need access to something. You can make dumb coding mistakes like we all make. And part of this is just understanding that those little things, they shouldn't bother you as much as, as you think they should. Um, I'd like to say barbarians are re resistant to slashing damage. You should become resistant to slacking damage. <laughs> make sure no one can interrupt you while you're in this mode. Um, and make sure that you re recognize that like, part of solving a problem is taking, taking hits along the way. So uh, go ahead. Be a barbarian. Maybe more of a smart hulk, though. <laughs> bards. Um, bards. We're going to do bards later. Clerics. <laughs> Clerics are the support team of a particular adventuring party. They're the healers. They often make sure that everyone is staying alive. And so in battle, they have a sort of a, typically a religious bent, and they use their uh, powers to heal damage that's being done by the party. So while everyone else is out there t having a fight, the clerics are making sure, okay, that person needs to be healed up. That person is dead. Let me get them not dead. Um, and they also have things that illuminate enemies so they're harder to see. So they kind of boost everyone else up in their ability to cause damage. And finally, they're particularly good at fighting undead enemies, uh, zombies, skeletons, vampires, that sort of thing. So, of course, we don't really have a concept of damage in data work. I mean, damage is something that, it's harm that's caused in such a way that it would impair the usefulness, the function, the value of the work that you're doing. It accumulates until you can't really go on. And I don't know that there's anything that's like, oh, that's right. <laughs> it's actually, it's tech debt. Um, so <laughs> clerics teach us that tech debt will drag you down if you let it accumulate. Right? As long as everyone else is still focusing on the projects that, that have been prioritized for a given quarter, someone needs to be looking behind and saying, is any of this stuff going to take us down? Because, you know, it, it, we've all had that experience where something undead keeps coming up over and over and over again and dragging people down, and you need someone who knows how to deal with that. As I mentioned, they have kind of a religious bent and an effort not to have some sort of weird culty religious uh, part of being a cleric. I'm just going to say this is the pantheon that I believe in when it comes to dealing with tech debt. So... I'm sure we can all find something to sort of lock into there. So, go ahead, be a cleric. Root out those hard-coded numbers in the project. <laughs> <laughs> so next on to druids. Druids are the natural magicians of, a day, of a, an adventuring party. They're defenders of the natural orders of things. They're friends to plants and animals. They can turn into plants and animals, and they can harness the elements. So, for example, they have something called Wild Shape, which lets them turn into a panther and gain all the speed of a panther, or they can turn into an eagle and get a bird's eye view of everything going on in the world. And they can also cast spells like Wall of Fire, Call Lightning, Tsunami. They're incredibly powerful. Similarly, Druids teach us to respect the ecosystem that we're a part of, right? We can, a Druid can't out lightning lightning itself, and I'm not going to be able to out finance the finance team, all right? So we have to understand that those of our stakeholders, what we're doing as analytics engineers in particular, but data professionals generally, is we are checking in their subject matter expertise into the ecosystem. We're harnessing it and using it for them so that we can leverage everything that they know about their particular domain. But that also means that we have to turn around and serve them as well. If, they, if they're giving us the knowledge that we're using to provide uh, insights for the rest of the company, we have to make sure that we're serving them too, because if you don't serve your stakeholders, they start serving themselves in a vacuum and nature abhors a vacuum. So go ahead, be a druid. Cast call finance. You should also call finance. <laughs> Fighters. Uh, so real bread and butter of the adventuring party. Some of my favorite characters on here. Um, 
I tried to gather as many as possible, but if I went through all the fighters that are in pop culture, we'd, we'd be here too long. It'd be one of those George Perez Avengers spreads, like that. <laughs> By the way, not true, Caps of Paladin, we're gonna get there. But fighters can be kind of boring on paper. Fighters fight, right? They're just in, in the battle, they're taking hits, they're giving hits. But what's amazing about fighters is actually they're pretty common as the first uh, type of a class that people play because they're familiar, right? All they need to do is keep fighting. They're proficient in most weapons. They're proficient in most armors. It can feel like a very comfortable place to be. And they also stay in the fight just about as long as a barbarian because they have something called an action surge that lets them take additional actions during a turn. And they have a second win that lets them heal right in the middle of battle, right? And so what does that teach us about being a fighter? Well, Tool proficiency is an end into itself. Um, we should learn to be proficient in the, the tools that help us along the way because sometimes a, a given day is just a fight. You have to slog through the work that we're doing. And we should know, know and be able to engage with different tools. And even if we don't understand a particular, say, BI tool, if we understand a BI tool, that will likely make us proficient in something that we're not familiar with, right? And the last thing I have here, which I really believe in, is you have to understand how best you become proficient in things. Do you do your best when you're taking a class where someone's sort of giving you the information? Do you shadow people really well? Do you just go and Google it? I just go and Google it sometimes. <laughs> but that's the way you learn, and you have, to be, you have to be able to identify how best you're going to skill up, right? So go ahead, be a fighter. Be like this guy. <laughs> On to monks. Um, monks I actually want to call out pretty quickly. Um, monks in pop culture have often been sort of an exoticism of a lot of other cultures, and I want to call that out. Um, I'm a big fan of all these characters, but it's definitely something that even the mechanics of the class kind of comes in, so I just want to be cognizant of the fact that's true. D&D uh, &D generally is sort of still grappling with not only its appropriation of a lot of cultures, but its <laughs> history of racial othering. So I uh, just wanted to call that out here. But monks are still amazing. Um, the amazing thing about monks is monks have a great connection with their own body. Right? They can harness this energy to become almost impossible to hit. They can catch arrows out of midair on their way to their face. Um, and they have this energy called key points, again, apologies, very appropriative, but that allows them to harness that energy and spend it to uh, deliver a flurry of blows in the middle of, a, of their turn, or uh, take what's called a step of the wind to just fly across the battlefield in an un unbelievable amount of speed. And so, uh, monks in particular might feel very, very familiar this week at Coalesce because, hey, y'all, we are all human beings in a human body, and this is an absolute gauntlet. <laughs> um, I have been recharging regularly uh, in my room because there's so much to learn here, so many people to meet, but uh, I feel that energy get depleted, and I will not be able to show up. Uh, I went to bed before 10 last night, mostly. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was helpful so, because I wanted to show up to this. So, we have to understand that the, the value of being sort of a, a monk in the data profession is to protect and defend your time. So be a monk. Self-defense isn't really weakness, you know? Paladins, there's Cap. Look at these power poses, right? Paladins are tough. Paladins take an oath. They take an oath to something like uh, redemption, glory, conquest, vengeance. And then a lot of their play style is revolving around keeping that oath, about holding to it, right? So when they, when they choose that oath, they kind of see the whole world in black and white or on some moral spectrum of the character that they are, whatever they've taken an oath to. Uh, like clerics, they can heal wounds, so they can do a little bit of healing. Uh, and also, when they're in the middle of a fight, they can bring their righteousness down as a smite, <laughs> which is, excuse me, a big burst of energy and power. Um, but it can be really hard to play a paladin. There's an expected rigidity to it. Sometimes you're there and your party is like shaking down a shopkeeper and trying to get a better deal and you're just sort of sitting there being like, this isn't really good. I don't know if we should be doing this. <laughs> Similarly, being a paladin in a professional sense means that there are professional standards that we're all trying to, to maintain and it can be really hard when someone says, hey, I know that this data upstream is not particularly what we want it to be. Can we kind of massage it away with some SQL? and make it a little bit easier to use. And it's kind of on us to say, hey, uh, stakeholder, I know that that would be very easy in this moment, but we kind of have to think about that long-term thing. Like, you know, again, related to clerics, we have to not create tech debt either. Um, but much like the being able to tell between good and evil, uh, a paladin also has to understand that that's a human being who just had a request, who's trying to solve a problem that they have. And you have to understand that that's not a bad intent that they're coming to you with. Um, 
I also mentioned here, it's, it's not easy to be a paladin in a professional sense either. Um, <laughs> Jermaine, uh, sometimes you feel like the fun police. Sometimes you feel like a hall monitor. Sometimes you feel like you are interrupting the flow of work. And it's really hard at small companies. I mean, my old actuarial job, everyone was a paladin all the time. We had literal professional standards. But um, it's, it's not necessarily easy. And you should pick those moments. Again, good and evil. Figure out when the right time to sort of draw those lines are. But as companies scale up into growth states and they need to actually leverage more, like fewer people to do more work, being a paladin really starts paying off. And I'm a big, big believer in that. So make Cat proud. Be a paladin. Rangers, a lot of good rangers on here too. I like, I like all these folks. Rangers are at home in the wild. They're our friends on the outskirts, sort of rugged ruffians roughing it on the regular. That's how I like to think of it. They, they are most comfortable in a very specific place in the world. It could be forests, it could be deserts, sometimes it's just straight up underground. Um, but in those places, they understand the lay of the land. They are more able to find their way. They can't get lost, they're able to find food. And similarly, they are knowledgeable about a particular set of monsters. It could be beasts, it could be devils, it could be the undead. Whatever it is, they know those things so cold, they can track them, they do extra damage, um, and it's a way for them to show up to the party and be guides in those particular places. So, similarly, as a data team, we're in, on the DBT Labs data team, we, there's a lot of embedded roles. I'm embedded on the product team. Uh, and you basically have to build out your realm of knowledge because either you're going to be working in it yourself and you have to kind of keep yourself alive day to day, or people are going to need to learn it and you're going to need to steward them through. And so, you know, it, it becomes the responsibility of anyone who has that sort of expertise to, to figure out whether or not that uh, is well tended to and also if it's easy for someone to join and understand. So, um, you know, if you have a realm of expertise, be a ranger. Uh, I know we're moving fast, I have 12 classes to get through, so we're getting, getting through it. Rogues, look at all those hoods and smirks. <laughs> Rogues might actually ev uh, evoke something if you're not necessarily familiar with these tropes. Uh, a rogue could be sort of the, the hooded assassin character, or it could just be Han Solo and be sort of a swashbuckling, you know, roguish type as it were. Um, and the reason that these are all kind of grouped together in the mechanics of the game are rogues know how to find their way in the middle of a fight to get into position to set up the circumstances so they can do what's called a sneak attack, which is an incredible burst of damage. They wait while the fighter's fighting them, while the barbarian's fighting them, they get into position and they stab deep. Um, and so that, that's sort of the main goal of the road. That's what's fun about it. Either you're, you're an assassin or you're just a swashbuckler who knows how to win a duel. Either way, that's how the rogue makes the biggest impact. There's also a mechanic called reliable talent, which is a little bit, probably about as crunchy as it will get, which is, you know, in role-playing games, you have a big list of skills, persuasion, athletics, acrobatics, these sorts of things. If a rogue is good at those things, there becomes a level that they reach where they can't really fail anymore. Um, it just becomes this floor where no matter what they roll with the dice, they're gonna continue being good at it. Rogues teach us that we kind of have to find the data work that is the greatest impact. We are all aware of the massive fire hose that data work can become. And it's very easy to play whack-a-mole with whatever's coming in, but we have to take a breath, take that 15 minutes in your day, look at everything and say, where am I gonna make the biggest impact? Because tactically, that's gonna, that's gonna put you on the map in terms of someone who's getting the right things done for the company. And similarly, if we set up our skills, if we learn these flows and rotations, you will realize that there are certain things that you don't feel like you can't do anymore. And those will help you be impactful in those moments. So I think that's something that the, the rogues can really teach us. So go ahead and, oh no, sorry. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about our magic users because these terms are pretty interchangeable for a lot of us who are not necessarily coming at it from role playing uh, standards. Sorcerer, warlocks, and wizards might sound exactly the same to you. So mechanically, what's different? Sorcerers have an innate magic they sort of show up with. Warlocks are gifted magic by a patron, which we'll get into, and then wizards just study and study and study and become magical. It's very uh, Twelfth Night. Some are, some are born magic, some achieve magic, and some have magic thrust upon them. So going into that, let's start with our sorcerers. Remember, the power's innate here. That's why we have all the X-Men. They're born with it. And, uh, oh, you know what? We're missing someone. That's right. That's a sorcerer. <laughs> Harry Potter was born magical, was blessed by a curse, and was a bad student, <laughs> all right? That's, that's a sorcerer with some half-hearted wizard levels. 
Uh, so just want to throw that out there. That's my last spicy take on sorcerers. Almost. <laughs> what sorcerers do? A sorcerer, as I mentioned, the power is innate. They are so familiar with their internal magical power that they actually become able to sort of bend it and shape it the way they want to. They have this thing called metamagic. So there's the same spells that the wizards and the warlocks are doing, but they're able to either do it a lot farther than those characters, they're able to do it to two different enemies where normally it would be one. They can even cast quietly so that no one realizes that they're about to cast a fireball. And so with this is a, a sense of the power within a, a sorcerer. They know what they can do. And similarly, we all show up with a unique talent. I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes. You show up to a team, you're like, man, my team is amazing. But you are showing up with something. And that thing is what makes you distinct within the world. And it could be something very soft skill, right? How do you work? Do you build people up? Uh, or do you, do you like follow a problem right to the end? These are things that you're bringing to work as a human being. Um, and we have to pay attention to that. What work charges us up? Where do we get in flow? Talk to our managers about that. Talk to our teammates about that. It's not necessarily that even though you both have the same role that you should learn how to do exactly the same things with exactly the same results. You should find out who's good at what and feel comfortable assigning things appropriately. Right? So be a sorcerer and find out where your own power is. A little, a little too real for people to break prod on a Friday? <laughs> Sorry. Also, not a sorcerer. <laughs> Sorry, I, I saw someone trying to take a picture. I promise the slides will be available afterwards because these are super fun and we should look into them more, more, at more depth. Um, let's talk about our warlocks. These people just made a little bit of deal for a little bit of power. It's fine. You know? she is great. Everyone likes she -Ra. Still Hexblade Warlock. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but who doesn't make a deal for a little bit of power sometimes? Uh, when I say making a deal, uh, warlocks have a patron. Sometimes uh, that is a, a fiend, some sort of devil who makes you make a deal with the devil. Sometimes it's some sort of fey creature. Maybe like, you know, think of, think of your, uh, once again, your uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, you make a deal with the great fairy court or something like that. Uh, or they could, it could just be some eldritch Cthulhu type character. Um, but whatever it is, they gain the knowledge to do magic, and they also gain some forbidden knowledge, more of a story kind of thing. But also the patron wants something. So, you know, again, demons, fey, all sorts of powerful creature, and the most powerful one of all. <laughs> it's important to find our leadership advocates, <laughs> is the way I like to phrase, phrase that. Um, when data is a part of leadership, I understand that there have been great talks like data led is dumb, and you know, there, there are ways in which getting too indexed on data can be harmful, but if you have a champion in the leadership space, you know that data has a seat at the table, you know that you can get the resources you need, and uh, that can really make a data team powerful. But much like the druids needing to deliver for their st stakeholders, when you make that relationship with leadership, you also do still need to make sure that you're delivering those insights, that you're doing what the leadership can tell you is strategically important. And on the topic of forbidden knowledge, I'm not sure how many people have this experience, but sometimes a data team ends up on the inside of some, some sort of more covert parts of being a, a company. Sometimes it's mergers and acquisitions. Sometimes it's product redirects. And the data team might be working kind of in a, in a bit of a, a shadow function to figure out like, whether or not that's tactically the right thing to do. And it can feel a little weird, a little bit warlocky to be working with a leadership that closely. But that's also an opportunity to speak up to leadership because you are the voice in the room. So go ahead, be a warlock. <laughs> but not to the devil. <laughs> All right, wizards. Some actual familiar wizards here. Not, not as many hot takes, although like I said, Doctor Strange, wizard very much a studious person. Wizards learn their magic. It's that simple. They study scrolls, they collect books, they are endlessly studying to get better and better at magic. And boy, do they. At the end of things, they go from knowing how to cast a fireball to being able to wish the world into a different shape. That's how powerful wizards get. This one's kind of boring, but what do wizards tell us? Just, just keep learning, you know? Go read all the substacks. Go read all the blogs. Beyond the proficiencies that the fighter has, this is about going and finding out how people are thinking about the space. Um, I'm a little nervous about this next slide because I know he's here, but be a wizard. <laughs> all right, it's time. Let's talk about bards. Oh, I see I'm going quite, quite long. I'll try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. Um, bards are inspirational. Um, there, there's a reason that I, I put this off to last is because I'm a big believer in it. 
Uh, whereas other powers are born or sworn to a, a patron or learned, bards understand that the right word or phrase or song is more powerful than a blade. Um, and they have something called inspiration, which they use to give to other people on the battlefield and boost them up. There's a, a quote that I love that is, uh, there's magic in a bard's song. They call it inspiration. And it tells the listener what they need to hear right when they need to hear it. And this is a superpower in my mind, right? We need to be, here we are at a technical conference where we are all telling our stories. We need to be able to communicate what we're doing to one another because otherwise we're just stuck in a hole thinking about the work that we're doing, right? And we need to know that part of being a data professional is kind of maybe some, sometimes the biggest part is telling the story that the data has for leadership, again, product. Either the data is telling a story or trying to get it to tell a story. And either way, that's the real business that's happening when you're a data professional. So uh, I'd like to encourage everyone, especially you know, here in the Slack, make sure you're telling your data story because there are people here who want to know that they're not alone in feeling lost um, or, or not understanding something they're working on. Just raise your hand. Tell your story. People here are going to be friendly about it. So you know, be a bard. All right, I know I'm, I'm really, really ramping up on time. I want to say in closing briefly, uh, a peek behind what it's like to be a DM. Sometimes when you're a dungeon master, you reach this moment in a fight where uh, someone turns to the other. Instead of saying, I'm going to fight the hobgoblin or slash at him or I'm going to cast a fireball, they look at another player and they say, are you ready? Are you ready is terrifying. Because <laughs> what are you ready means is that those players are about to combo you. They're about to build up their, their particular skills and attack you from both, both sides. Combinations include a wizard laying down a fireball when a barbarian is right in the middle of the fight, a cleric blessing a, an arrow so that the ranger strikes even more, or even a paladin and a druid teaming up with an enlarged potion and a polymorph to turn a hydra fight into a kaiju fight. <laughs> this is actual art that we had commissioned of one of my games because it was so incredible. Look at the little paladin head on the crocodile. <laughs> Combos are incredible, because they're the perfect synergy of, of mechanics and skills and players and characters and story. All right, they're the moments you talk about. They're the moments you tell your friends, you need to get into RPGs because this is the kind of stuff that can happen, right? That you commission art of. So let's think about it from a data standpoint. What if the monk is deflecting not only their own time and energy, but the barbarian, so the barbarian can stay locked in on the thing that they're in flow on? What if the fighter and the wizard pull in so much proficiency, so much knowledge, that the data team feels like there's nothing they're not aware of or can't do? What if the druid is capturing all the subject matter expertise so that the rogue knows exactly what needs to be done because everyone else is self-serving, the rogue can focus on that big strike? All right. A data team, even a data team of one, needs to bring these combinations to create a balanced, smooth-running data function within their company. I'm going to try my hand at one last bit of bardic inspiration. I appreciate everyone's patience. I've said before that data stewardship at a company is like fighting a Hydra. You knock down one business question, two more pop up in its place. Oh, revenue? That's great. What is it for this region? Right? But the work is never truly finished. The task might seem insurmountable. But I want to tell each and every one of you, and each and every one of you, that on any given day, you can access all of these skills, build a sort of party, whether just alone or among your team, and meet that Hydra at eye level and do the job. So with that, I only have one more question left. Are you ready? That's it. That's my